Music Company. My name is Wazzy Brewster and I am the founder and executive director of the MIDI Music Company. I also have managed a band called United Vibrations, so obviously this is right up their streets in terms of being eco warriors and uh, future Afro jazz. And um, they have a particular dra track called Grow and another one called Sophia that I think sticks very well with sustainability and the eco in the environment in the sense that it talks about the goddess and as she comes to earth in the animated video you see she's in this beautiful land with these four young men traveling and enjoying the earth and the animals and the trees and then they get to the sea and then as they look across the sea you see them cry and those tears of sadness in the sense that in the distance what they see is the pollution of what mankind does to the sea, to the earth, to everything. So I think it's very fitting that the MIDI Music Company has this partnership and supports the Ocean Generation Foundation and welcomes you to our space to begin your campaign and the year long and more of all the partnerships and everything that you shall have. So I'm just welcoming you and do some formals so if you haven't seen, been to the toilets yet, please go out this door <coughs> and to the left in the lounge there is a disabled toilet which is accessible to all. Or you can go out to the door to the right outside and go across the courtyard and there's a block of toilets next to the recording studios. Um, we've got tea and coffee and stuff up here but there is a kitchen upstairs if you did want to go up to the kitchen and, and utilise the kitchen. And if the fire alarm did go off, we would go straight out of these doors through the gate of the courtyard and to the left of the park to a very large tree and we would meet there to make sure that we're all present and safe. <laughs> so, with those little things over and done with, I now would like to introduce Daisy Kendrick, who is the founder of the Generation Foundation, Ocean Generation Foundation. Thank you so much, Wazi, and thank you so much for letting us have this space and host this event here today. Pleasure. Um, we're incredibly excited to be here. This is the first of our Rift Sustainably campaign panel discussions that we're hosting. Um, we're an organisation that's dedicated to raising awareness about oceans and climate change and its importance. There's a lot of noise right now across social media and the news about plastic pollution and, and climate change. So there's no denial that it's happening now, it's affecting all of us, and it's affecting humans. And it's starting to affect communities both here and in more remote locations, especially on islands which are more vulnerable to threats of climate change. Um, the idea behind doing stuff climate change and music started from um, an idea last year that Ocean Generation launched a My Oceans campaign, which was a song written about the oceans and environment, um, which we've had numerous artists, including some here from MIDI, that have done their versions of the ocean song. Um, and we really believe that music has the power to connect people and to raise awareness in that unique form. Um, but today we're hosting a panel discussion um, and we have some panellists that have done really amazing things both in the environmental space and the music space. And we really want to open up this discussion to start talking about how the music industry can impact the environment and make a positive change. So today we have Steve Lewinson, who is an artist manager, writer, producer, has worked with some incredible artists with an amazing career. Um, and he's also been a great supporter of Ocean Generation in the past with some other events that we've done. Um, with music. We have Clara Neal, who is the founder of A Greener Festival, which is a non-profit dedicated to making festivals greener. And we have Kiara, who's from Julie's Bicycle, which is another non-profit within the music space fighting for the environment. And Kiara works on a bunch of different projects um, at Julie's Bicycle. And we also have Catherine, who unfortunately has had a bit of a family emergency, so she's going to be coming in and out. But um, we're really grateful to meet Catherine today who, prior to getting involved with Ocean Generation, she's actually written her own Ocean song um, as an artist, so it would be really interesting to hear why she did that and, and how she thinks music can, can help the environment. So, um, to start off, I was actually going to start with Kiara and ask, you know, you're working within a non-profit for environment and music. Can you set the scene for our audience in terms of why it's important to fuse these industries, what's happening, and where's the change? Uh, 
Sure. Um, I think Julie's bicycle was formed from an understanding and a belief um, very much that we have a lot of the technological solutions and actually we sort of know what needs to happen politically to address climate change and a lot of other environmental challenges, but it's not happening. And the reason that's not happening is because somehow or other we're not feeling it culturally. Um, it seems like a really distant issue and it's really hard to get to grips with um, and it tends to fall off the agenda. So what we need really is a, is a fundamental cultural change in the way that we relate to the environment, we relate to climate, um, climate change and we relate to people at the other end of the world. Um, and culture in so many ways is, is shaped by what's coming up, the arts and the creative industries and maybe music more than any other. Um, music has this incredible power to bring people together. Um, and Julie's Bicycle was founded originally on an idea that to really tap into that potential of the music industry, you know, you need to give musicians and artists and everyone who's out there, you need to give them a platform of integrity to speak their message from. So it's not actually enough to just put on a gig always and sort of go, we're going to raise awareness for this and then it'll be fixed. But also looking very honestly at, okay, what are our own issues? How can we address our own impacts? Um, and how can we better understand what our role is within all of this? And between those two, the incredible creativity of the artists on stage and the way that they bring people together, the incredible creativity of the workforce and the music industry that, to be honest, can come up with solutions out of gaffer tape and a lot of good hope that you know a lot of other industries can only dream of. Um, and between those two, that um, there was this huge potential that really wasn't being tapped into, and if we could only activate that, um, amazing things would happen. Um, we're not the first to be in this space. I think you know, art and environment as a relationship spans back decades and decades um, to at least the 60s and 70s, but probably earlier. Um, I think what we have seen over the past 10, 15 years is a change in how some of that is seen, and, and again, just a, a different kind of understanding of how what happens behind the scenes um, relates to what happens on stage. Um, and. A, a huge upswell, especially in the past year or two, from audiences as well. Um, the, where this sits in people's imagination has really changed, um, even between what happened before Christmas with the screenings of Blue Planet 2 and how that animated everyone's interest in particularly plastic pollution, but more widely what's happening to our oceans. Um, so I think we're, we're at a moment, a moment where pretty much it feels like something is finally possible after years and years of negotiating and pushing for things to happen. Um, yeah. That's great. And Steve, well, you're an artist. You've been on stage, you've been behind stage, you've been touring, flying all around the world. You know that flying is a huge, commits a huge carbon footprint. But, you know, based on your experience and now, which Kiara says we're at a moment in history where there may be change, how do you see your journey from the very start of touring to now and the future of what touring and artists can do? I would say there was probably less awareness before. So tools were more about reaching your audience and just sharing your music. <coughs> Whereas now, with Planet, organizations like yours, there is def there's definitely more of an awareness. And you're looking at, I'm not, I'm, I'm a recent conversationist myself, I should say, because of my wife, Renee. <laughs> is actually the one that's got to drag me on with kicking the screen, so I'm not, this is fair to you, and I'm, that's why I'm part, I'm part of the conversation. But I would say, start with the artists, culturally, if the artists start looking at, start having those conversations with their managers, with their record companies, promoters, and obviously with their family, then we can work downwards that way. So that, for me, we could look at travelling. Uh, we travel maybe for a year. There's a lot of flights. Yeah, that's the name this year. And um, maybe at the planning stages. No, you are. So you definitely think it's kind of a top-down approach. Definitely. It has to be, yeah. you know, as you say, the managers, the promoters, those who are organising the events that have to start thinking about this from the top. Well, I think the artists. Mm -hmm. So they have to ask for it. Yeah. Okay. 
So if the artist would say, if you're going to play a, a show, then you might stipulate in your contract, I would like, you, you could dress up drinking straws or plastic or something. I think the artists have to say, and the artists have to let their management know that that's what they want. And then the management would say that to the record company. So if you sign with the record company, you wouldn't be surprised by, oh, what's this doing backstage? Because it's in your contract. So you, you, you're, you're clear what you stand for. And your fans know what you stand for. You can tell your fans. Um, maybe you could carpool on the way to shows. Maybe we could, it, it, that kind of awareness. I think, I think top down, definitely. Mm -hmm. So that's really great because probably some of the artists here today, they can definitely start thinking about that going into their careers and, and what they want totally. when they're starting performing, etc. Yeah, so and the industry will follow the yeah. artists. Exactly. And then Claire, you're already implementing on a daily basis with Greener Festival. Can you talk a bit about that organisation and what you guys do? Yeah, so um, just to give a background about how it began, um, we kind of came from the opposite way but I 100% agree with what you're saying and it could be that, that that meeting now would mean that it actually all kicks into place um, but how we began was um, I started going to free parties in the woods as a teenager which was a great way to start anything I believe and uh, at the same time I was doing music industry management at university looking into having some kind of a career within the music industry and I started to work on major festivals in the UK um, that had huge burger vans, massive diesel generators, no separated waste, etc. Whereas conversely, those free parties in the woods, people would rock up with a solar-powered sound system, organic food, they'd have compost things and separate all the waste and leave it completely spotless. And so I thought there's such a huge disparity between the formal business of festivals and then this alternative underground scene, there's no way that the business are ever going to listen to uh, what the hippies are up to in the woods. So, <laughs> so I thought, well, could I do some kind of research for my dissertation that will show that the audiences want it and make a business case for it? So that's what my dissertation was focused on. And then my lecturers at university were luckily part of the industry. And they said, actually, this is really relevant. So let's turn it into a website. And then festivals all around the world just started to get in touch saying we're really interested in want to do more. And it just evolved from there quite organically. Um, but the way that we've worked with events, it's always been the festival organisers or the event organisers really who are the ones that are doing our assessments, for example. And so now we're looking at uh, what's happening with the waste management, the power contractors, their own transport plans, um, what kind of procurement they have into the event, etc. Um, but it's not been coming from the artist, it's been coming from the organiser. Um, and some things have happened along the way, for example, at um, Glastonbury Festival about three years ago, I think, they started, have you got your metal cup there? We started to give like these these metal bottles to the crew um, to backstage, but um, they had it. Um, I also worked for Arcadia Spectacular, which is one of the, the venues at Glastonbury, and we had it for all of our crew. But on the pyramid stage, they were like, "No, we can't have it from backstage here because the artists are worried about not having a sealed bottle and mm. like the, ch the chance of something happening and." And so they said, because of the artists, we won't do it. But then conversely, we were at um, Primavera, I think last year in Spain, where I think it was Radiohead who, said, who insisted that they have a water dispenser on the main stage. And because they were the headliner, therefore, every artist that played used the reusables and the water dispenser. <laughs> so it shows how that communication with the artists can have a really significant impact all the way mm -hmm. down the chain. Um, there was another point we were talking about earlier in relation to the artists being able to, to give the message as well, but they're often worried about if they make a stand about something, are they going to then be criticised for it? Do you want to talk a bit about that? Because I'm talking about can't do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the, where we came from very early on was in part recognising the power of the artist, but also recognising that barrier, that it's um, 
as an industry, we tend to put a lot on artists, and everyone else does as well, you know, it's like, can you be out there, can you represent this charity, can you represent this cause, and it's really, again, how as an industry, how can we create an ecology that helps to enable that action by the artist, so that when an artist comes and asks for something, you are able to offer that, but also, if an artist steps up there and says something about climate change, and the audience comes back, or the press comes back and goes, but you fly, but you do this, um, as an industry, the music industry can step forward and say, but we've done all of these things on climate change and to protect the environment. Um, so what have you done yesterday, more or less? Because if we all, you know, if we all stopped ourselves from talking out about this mm -hmm. because we're hypocrites, then none of us will be talking about it. But it's almost how can we make sure that there are enough people to support those voices that are willing to step forward yeah. and do that in a way where there is a lot of stuff going on. And I think as Claire says, there is that interplay, isn't there? And it's it's funny because sometimes it's also a bit of a hot potato, you know, the festivals or the venues say, well, we'll do it, but only if the artists ask for it. And the artists kind of say, but it's not really in our power because, you know, the venues and the festivals and the record labels have all the infrastructure. So it's kind of, it's how do we break that, that conversation open? Um, yeah, we're kind of seeing that there's a lot of different moving parts to the music industry, individuals, artists, higher level but there's not that cohesive body at the moment. But I think one of the big things with climate change as well is that sometimes it feels a very distant topic. Sometimes people think, oh, well, it's not my responsibility, or, oh, it's not affecting me today, but actually, you know, it's impacting us all. But with that in mind, you know, we have to make it simple for artists or individuals or fans or the music, higher level people in the music industry to make switches so that there will be a change as opposed to just talking about it. Um, Claire, what kind of solutions do you have for festivals or for individuals to make greener switches that can be effective? The actual operational side of festivals, we um, look at everything from, for example, with the waste management. A big element of that is, first of all, that waste management comes after your procurements. So what are you buying in the first place? What are you bringing into the event? And what are other people bringing into the event? And then you think about what happens with them afterwards. And, and even now, after all this time, um, we find that that's something that people along the chain, whether it's the market managers or the bar managers, etc., they still don't necessarily realise that all the time. So there'll be a team that are booking the waste management and they'll say, okay, we need X number of skips, X number of bins. Let's separate out compost, plastic, like metal, um, and then general waste. Um, and we'll need probably this much because we've got this many people coming. And they don't think to go, well, okay, so what are you actually bringing on to site? Are you bringing disposable cups? Are you bringing reusable cups? Are you, are you allowing facilities to have reusable materials? If you separate out all your compostable waste, is there even anywhere to take it afterwards? Um, and with the caterers, that's something we big push for anti-plastic at the moment. The waste management and the packaging industry are actually struggling quite a bit because you could just stop plastic tomorrow, but there isn't a full solution for what do you replace it with. So reusables, like wherever possible, it's reusable, reusable, reusables. But then there's a lot of alternative, like bioplastics, for instance, coming out, or different materials that are biodegradable or compostable that then end up not actually being able to be processed anywhere, or they can cause more complications when being produced as well. So you have to be quite careful about what you're bringing in and not to just use eco-branded things thinking that's going to be a good solution. So a lot of it comes down to communication between the different teams and planning. And then another element that we look at, for example, is power and how you power, um, say, a tour or a show. And is it actually a correct specification of the amount of power that you need? or has there been a huge amount of buffers put on time after time by whether that's the tour manager, like the lighting team, the video team, the, you know, everybody along the chain, plus the production manager, plus the power contractor. If everybody adds on their little buffer to be safe, you can end, end up with hugely over-specified power, which means that you burn a lot more fuel and spend a lot more money on bringing 
generators in that you don't necessarily need. Um, so that's another aspect. Um, I could talk for about 10 hours at least <laughs> about things that you can do. But you have all of these things online at Puna Festival for other people to check out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a huge amount of resources. And um, like on the Julie's Bicycle website, on the Greener Festival website as well, there's lots of guides. There's also an organisation called Powerful Thinking, which is a lot of guides about the power. Um, there's the Energy Revolution, who've just done a new guide about transport as well different ways that organisers can work with transport. A lot of it comes down to monitoring as much as communication, so you can see where you're at at the moment in order to make the changes. Um, but the, I think the key is to, if you're having to change something for the audience, or for your crew, or for anybody involved, is to make it, ideally the default option is the greener option, certainly the easier or the cheaper option as well. So I think that where we've been going wrong sometimes is making the green solution, let's say that's for example, you're going to stay in the green campsite where you don't leave all your stuff and everything's really lovely and you're clean up and, and don't leave everything behind. And then that might sometimes be the more difficult option to take as someone going to the festival, which I think we've got back to front. It should be that actually that's the easier option, that's the cheaper option, and if you're not going to do that, that's more difficult. So this is what we're trying to work out collectively for every part at the moment. Yeah, so this, it's about finding new innovations and ways to make it easier to be more environmentally friendly. Exactly. So one of the things that I think have talked about is to do with technology earlier, yeah. and the role of technology and how that can help in the future meeting things more environmentally friendly. What's your thoughts on virtual reality for experiences? Or? I like the idea. I don't think it's ready yet. It's when we're doing a show, or when we're doing when any artist is performing as an artist, you're connecting with your audience. And that's the primary need we have as humans. We're trying to connect, we're sharing. And I don't think the art answers that yet. So maybe in the future. Um, Something I was quite excited about was um, there's a studio in East London called Premises, I think, you know, and they have a solar powered studio. I think it's the only solar powered studio. Yeah, they installed them in 2011. Um, they installed them in 2011. I think it might be the only one. I think it's the only one. I'm not sure why it's the only one. There might be some private ones that some artists have. It's a commercial studio that runs on solar power and is working. I, and that's more immediate than virtual reality. It's yeah. not answering the same question, mm -hmm. but there is some technology here. The other thing I think would be useful is to have more conversations like this, because from where I'm sitting, it always feels quite disjoint. So mm. that the green camp are here talking about something, and then maybe you speak to yeah. the government or something, and the artists are over here doing what they do. Yeah. And then, and apart from critiquing them and saying, why are you flying like this? Why are you doing this? It's like, well, hey, I, what? <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it's you need more dialogue, more conversation. Yeah. So it's it's like, it's like a cultural shift. So that we actually start talking about it, unless you're going to change the law and order people to do something, which is like, like in belts, some cases like it works. Belts, yeah. So. yeah, or the plastic bag deposit. It, exactly, which could work. But I, I think the more powerful thing is is social awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of artists talking to their fans, artists talking to people like you, and, and not. Maybe not with a fixed result in mind, but just have a conversation and say, okay, how do you set up a tour? Mm -hmm. Like for, for a tour, the tours I do, they're up to 100 people traveling. Mm -hmm. And I know I've seen tours where there's 300 people traveling. So it's not like, it's like a, a mobile company with lots and lots of departments. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a catering, it's one company. Yeah. The lighting, another company. There's carpenters, there's security, there's transport. There's wardrobe, there's the band, there's the band's crew. Mm -hmm. there, it, there's a lot of people. And so if they had, if you could be involved that early, when they're conceptualizing it all, conceptualizing mm -hmm. the ideas with the artists, um, we could talk about trains. Mm -hmm. I've done some traveling by trains, which everyone would love. I don't know how practical <laughs> it is. Yeah. You know, because you're fixed. It's, it's tricky. There's Damon Alba and um, I think he just did it, yeah. Express. What it's called now. Do you remember? I think Steve Budd. Africa Express. Steve Budd. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
their train tour, but it does kind of limit where you can go. Where it does limit. And you have to make sure everyone gets on the train. As well. <laughs> <laughs> but then we have to make sure everyone gets on the plane as well. So I've been on tours where people That's have very missed, missed flights. <laughs> Not me, but... <laughs> I've also seen artists left behind at festival sites that miss their bus, so... Yeah. You know, it's totally <laughs> I think it's if you can have a friendly conversation, so that you're actually saying, okay, you've done whatever on private jets for 15 years, that's fine. Well, it's not fine, but, but we're not talking about that now, we're talking about where we are, we see where we are now, we're not going to talk about what you did in the 80s or 90s, we're going to say, what do you think? Mm -hmm. How feasible, viable design. might it be to talk about a train? Exactly, I think so. Mm -hmm. And so, and not just with the artists, so you, maybe an A&R guy is more for management yeah. organisations and labels and publishers. Rob. <laughs> <laughs> so that everyone's included in the conversations, so no one's surprised. So you can't do that thing of, uh, and this happens to artists a lot, where the artist will never get to hear. The venue will say, yeah, the artist won't like that. Or the security said, oh no, the artist won't like that. The artist doesn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, and then it. you go away thinking, oh, she only wants brand M&Ms or something. The artist has no idea. Because yeah. they're not privy to this conversation. And when you said about, is it Radiohead? Yeah. With the show and then what water cooler? Mm -hmm. And the hills and oh, okay. it's like water, it's water. Yeah, it's just but someone it's just for having someone a thinking like, oh no, 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 they won't want that. They won't want that, they won't want that. And then that. it's like, it's oh, they said they don't want that. Okay, they don't want but that. It, but if we have conversations like this more regularly, yeah. I mean, no one can say that. Actually, one like, of my working titles for it, uh, <laughs> I thought, I'm not going to actually make this title because none of the agents will come. But, um, <laughs> but I was like, okay, should we have a panel that's about the artists? And is it really the artists or are agents just mean? And yeah. <laughs> 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 I was like, working title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that we started looking at um, about seven or eight years ago was very much the idea of a green rider. So a rider that sits alongside the hospitality and tech riders, yeah. which can be as sort of detailed or in depth or as top line as any artist feels comfortable with. So on the top line level, it might be something as simple as the water bubbles, like our crew and all of our crew and touring party are going to have refillable bubbles. Can you make sure we can refill them backstage? I know that. I think the Dave Matthews band did it with one of their big tours um, over in the States and they calculated roughly how much money in dollars they'd saved, not necessarily themselves, but to all the promoters or venues yeah. on the tour as well, and it was at least a five figure sum. Because if you if you taught up all of these pallets of plastic bottled water mm. that are being bought within the industry by promoters, by venues, mm. by artists, and you turn that into a money amount. It's absolutely staggering that this is money that is just going being away. and being thrown away. And then, you know, it's, it's such a bugbear, I think, for a lot of people who work in production as well. You see people and they grab one bottle, have a sip, put it down, forget <laughs> which like, one's which mine, one don't know, I'll have another one. one. And then at yeah. the end, you, you're just left with these piles of them. Yeah. And that's quite a simple intervention in the grand scheme yeah. of things. And then you get people who are more involved. So you have someone like Jack Johnson, who occasionally specifies that he wants venues to install LED lighting in um, backstage at the venues that he plays at, depending on how big the tour is. He's at a level where he can make that demand. And he's thinking, how can I make a lasting change in this venue beyond just when I'm there? That will also benefit the venue, because they'll save, yeah. they'll save money, money on the energy yeah. costs in the long run. So they'll hate him in the beginning. <laughs> 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 like, oh, God, this is complicated. And that's often a big thing, the economic side. Everyone's almost afraid of being eco-friendly because they think it's going to cost much more money, and they're scared of it. But it almost seems that employment can be created from this new environmental side, as you say, if someone was to ride along with huge productions with 300 people, you know, that could be a job for a young person implementing sustainability on the tour, etc. But also, you know, this fear of, oh, we're going to be spending more money. Actually, there's cases where they're saving money. So it's a two-in-one. But um, do you have any experiences where you face that of, oh, we don't want to change, we don't want to do anything because of the economic side? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the greatest challenges. I think a lot of the job that we've done over the past 10 years is, is looking at the economic case for this and looking at the business case for it. Um, and, you know, just to humanity in general around climate change. Um, there's the financial case, which is very much where can the money be saved, um, and sometimes it'll cost more. I mean, part of this is investment into new solutions, it's investment into doing things differently and better. 
Um, but how do we get to a point where we're not scared of that investment? Because as an industry, you invest in all kinds of things. If you think in your long-term trajectory, like thinking ahead to the future, you have to change things. You have to invest into finding those better ways of doing things. I was at a round table yesterday and the head of a, a theatre in London put it really wonderfully. Um, they made a change, which is actually as simple as stopping the sale of plastic bottled water from the bar, which means they took a huge financial hit on it because of the markup on those. But she said, you know what? I, we just sat down and we said, that's actually the cost of doing business in today's context. It's taking a financial hit on some of those things because it's the right thing to do. Um, but in other cases, there are huge savings to be made, like with powerful thinking. Um, so Judy's Bicycle and a Greener Festival both sit on this group, bringing together festival organisers, power suppliers, and other stakeholders looking at the way energy is supplied at festivals. And there, people have started identifying up to 40% reductions in, in fuel and in diesel use. They've saved 80%. 80%. <laughs> so that's a huge bottom line change um, through a change of working and a huge bottom line saving. And then the last one is around legislation and regulation. As you said, sometimes it's a stick as well. But even in, in the UK, there's the Climate Change Act, which theoretically mandates legally a reduction in carbon emissions um, by a certain date. And at some point, that legislation, that regulation is going to start trickling through to businesses in different ways. So either we're ready to confront that and live with it, or we could get caught out by it. Right. Do you have a question? So, yeah. Do you invite? Production managers and art directors and the people who help plan for the those meetings. And Not the powerful thinking ones, but we have had conversations with some of them. I think right. particularly around the issue that Claire says, because often festivals they'll get the spec from the production manager about right. we need X amount of energy to power the light show that we're bringing in. So I know one festival, and I don't know what the outcome was, but they they asked each production manager like, okay, I know this is your spec. Realistically, how much power do you think you'll actually use? And then they also monitored from the generators how much power they, in the end, generally use to compare the three figures because everyone knows you add a safety margin, but probably even if you're not adding that margin, you're thinking it's going to use a lot more energy. I, I, I feel that the, the earlier you get in speaking to them, because mm -hmm. from my experience, in, in the band, the, the band usually turn up to a venue, so we'll be in a hotel and turn up. Maybe four o'clock for sound check, the show eight or nine, we'll party afterwards, go back to the hotel. The production manager, they're in at six, seven in the morning, and they don't leave until everyone's left. So they're in until maybe one o'clock in the morning, and if they're below you're cooking out, drive to the next place, set it up, same again, same again, same again. So the earlier you can talk to them and get them involved, because they're, I think they're they're probably the most stressed people on the tour in terms of <laughs> yeah. uh, responsibility. They have so much on their shoulders. So the earlier you can, so if you wait too late, and it's like another, oh no, 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 it's a thing to worry about. But it has to be when Whereas the tour's really being advanced. Exactly. You know, when the tech the specs are going stage, in and you yeah. send what you're going to require for what the even, venue. Even before that, actually, when they're actually thinking of touring, mm -hmm. and you say, have you thought about these elements? So they can put it in into the pot mm. on the table as they're thinking, okay, we want to travel to Brazil, America, Eastern Europe, these the green effects, and put it at that early, I think it's that mm. early. Because any time after that, you, you come up against human resistance because of the pressure it's of the industry, 90%, nearly 90% of artists' income is, is made on the road. And so if you say to an artist, we're going to talk for this much, you've made a commitment that we will do this many shows, we'll make this much money. And everyone's got an account, and they're going to go, gross, minus this, net. And so they're going to walk up. It's like for anyone doing a show now, you do a show for 50 pounds, you're going to pay your taxi or rent to the PA. And so if someone came to the last minute, oh, and by the way, so the earlier you can do that, then we factor that in as well. Mm. Plus think. it should be it should mean that your net is higher if you're well, like having But it also becomes part of the the, the, the awareness is raised. So it's something that people ask in the same way they say, Who's doing the cooking? They say, Have we looked at the green element? Have we looked at the so that people yeah. get used to saying that and then they well, say it as easily as it's, um, it's really helped with um, for instance our cage at Glastonbury when we travel on okay. tour it's almost like being the artist because we go with a whole stage. 
um, and the crew, but we're booked in by a promoter from place to place. Right. Um, so rather than us being the promoter in that case, and we were analysed for our power consumption at Glastonbury so that we could see the peaks and the averages. So we knew in reality that we actually needed to generate a power spec half the size, which meant then when we went on tour, we could already say, actually, we only need half the size. I think this is really important, you know, from your perspective to say, actually, you know, we want to be at the table for us to implement change. We want to be at the discussion table, but we need to be that early so that we can have an impact and be part of the the decision process of incorporating green that you know you guys know so well into the creative side and touring etc. And touring and so touring America may not be relevant. I don't know. I don't. It may not be relevant to everyone here, but it might be. But it's it certainly will be hopefully. But it's more about what impact you have right now and what mm -hmm. conversation will they have now? Because there was a slight danger that because if you're when I was just doing shows around London, <coughs> pub down the road. But, that would be, yeah, well, when I get there, I'll think about it. It, yeah. can, it become that thing you can off-put it. Mm -hmm. So it's to think about things that are that impactful now as well. Mm -hmm. Impactful for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just to think about and to talk exactly. about. But in, in maybe on, yeah. the, that's why I was curious to know if there are any artists and how they, what they feel about this. Well, yeah. if I maybe start, um, Ozzy, with the intro to the program that we run here. Um, most of the artists here are part of the Creative Industries Careers Advice Service and it's for any crea young creative aged 16 to 30 who wants to work within, primarily within the music industry, but we do have a BAFTA, we have a BAFTA award winner. Hello, hello, Billy Wisdom, baseline. And I thought I was loud, I could always be louder. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we um, primarily, their they're music, their acting, their dancers, their graphic designers, their filmmakers, they work across and they, they really become a network because we've been running what we call Seekers, C-I-C-A-S. Um, we've been running that for 21 years. So our third client was The Noise Ads. Um, and uh, we've got DJ and G, one of our producers who did Katie B's first hit, Tell Me. And in the house today, we've got Fotoric, we've got Barbarella's Bang Bang, we've got Oggy, um, we have Ahmad on the engineering, but he's actually a member of United Vibrations, uh, the eco band, we've got Laura Lamb in the house, we've got Satunji, and we've got some new artists, Taylor, Taylor Lee, uh, emerging young artist, and Angelina Luzzi. So, um, I think why the MIDI Music Company wanted to be a part of this as well is about if you start at this point, before everybody's big and large scale, and going back to what you were saying, Steve, um, and the thinking's coming from the artists with their team, right from the seed. So when we talk with United Vibrations, not only are they eco warriors, they come from a self-built house. Their parents taught yoga. Um, their dad comes from working within the environment. They have solar panels, they have recycled toilets. It's their work, they taught me a lot. I don't think I was as green as I am until I started working with United Vibrations. So when my rapper in Mauritius, I remember Ahmad, threw my rapper out the window or the minibus as he uh, were, <laughs> you did a job, and he made such a thing about it. And I thought, yeah, but give somebody a job, they could be, that's why they could pick up rubbish. And, but that was my, and that's 10 years ago. That's 2008, March, actually, almost exactly 10 years ago. I remembered, and I felt really bad about it. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, yeah, littering, waste, okay. And then we started here with Julie's Bicycle because we're what you call an MPO under the Arts Council funding, we're a national portfolio organisation. And um, we started to look, we have an environmental policy at the Mini Music Company, and we started to look at our recyclable cups. So these are all recyclable. We changed what we started to buy. Ecover, what do we wash up with? What do we clean with? How green can we go with our cleaning materials? Um, our waste, okay. So it cost us a bit more to have recycled waste, but we feel better, mm -hmm. certainly about it. That's just the local authority. They charge you for your different bins. So we've got two lots of recycle and one normal bin. Because I think that most people, because there are recycled bins 
all around the building. Most people have ch are choosing now to put the recycle in the recycle, and our cleaner comes around and collects everything and makes sure that we're, we're putting the rubbish out in that way, as long as they're recycling properly, because that's another thing. You know, you're hearing stories of whoever collects all of our waste, not really splitting out the recycle stuff, <clears throat> and nobody really going through that. That's really important, because for me, I need to know that's being done. If I'm going to make this effort, if we're going to make this effort, the people on the other end mm -hmm. have to also make that done. Um, and I think with a lot of the artists who've, who've covered <coughs> the Oceans track, they'll tell you a bit about themselves and what they're doing um, themselves. But really from a MIDI music company point of view and who we are supporting our artists mm. is encouraging a way of thinking, uh, which is really, you know, you were saying about the impact. It's really a, just a way of thinking. I know that in 10 years I have a different thought process on recycling and, and the environment and what it means to me. And um, I've, I've actually got an article on an event that's coming up in May with uh, Michael Gove, with government, all around plastics. Um, and my parents grew up in Barbados. And, and you know, I'm from Deptford, I'm South East London, but um, every time I go to Barbados, I'm always, our house in Barbados, solar panels. It's just automatic. Um, when you are buying drinks, you buy a crate of pop, all bottled, and it's automatic that you will drink your drink, rinse it out the bottle, put it back into the crate, take that back and get your five dollars back for the crate, and and it's you just recycle. They, they, you know, just generally on the island, it's a small island, so you better be clean, otherwise you won't have much left generally. But it's a way of life. That's the first time I ever went to Barbados. I was thirteen. I was like, oh, well, you get money for your drinks, but actually, think about Britain. In the 60s and 70s, that's what we yeah. used to do. Yeah. You used to put all your bottles back and recycle bottles, and we had paper bags, not plastic bags. So it was really, I think, the World Food Health Organization, who um, are the creators of supermarkets and supermarket chains, and they're also the um, people behind how food trade happens around the world. They also have a huge role to play. So, you know, if you're not a vegan or a vegetarian, I'm more of a pescatarian myself, but they have a huge role to play in the way in which cattle are farmed mm -hmm. and uh, the poisons, the nine poisons that are still in our foods, even though they're banned, um, but they still use them to a minute degree. Um, there is something to do with, take me back to my grocers, I'm an old school girl, <laughs> go around the corner to the butchers, the bakers, yeah. and the grocers and actually you receive stuff in a paper bag mm -hmm. so how do we get ourselves to actually where we used to be yeah. not polluting so much and yes of course we're on computers and uh, mm -hmm. smartphones how do we use energy how do we get cleaner energy so really just yeah. over to the artist just to introduce that yeah do you want to introduce the artist yeah who uh, i shall introduce the artist that's going to perform or, or i mean yeah. i think people might have comments here yeah, if anyone has so any yeah questions. anybody has Laura? Yeah. Laura Lem. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm really glad to be a part of this conversation. It's really interesting. And uh, just a few things that came to mind is um, I, I've moved outside of London. I live in a small village. And for me to recycle, I have to drive uh, 15 minutes to a recycling centre that is about the size of this room but covers a like massive massive town so basically no one's recycling and go and put all the stuff in all the separate things and it it actually made me so mad when I first realized because I thought this is ridiculous and it, it takes so much to, it, it really is an extra cost because I have to pay for the fuel there and back to go and do it and it's a lot of time and effort for me to do so my parents who live in the same town they can't be bothered and I totally get it yeah. And that, I think that's, that's a lot of the problems here is, like with the supermarket, it's so much easier. The quick option, the easy option is always, for me now, feel, for me, there's so many options that are quicker and easier, but there aren't the ethical one. Yeah. And I find myself still making mistakes. I'm like, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. You know what I mean? But you just, you, you go on automatic mode, like, you know, throwing litter out the window. <laughs> or something you, you've been taught or you, you haven't been taught. So you're doing something in yeah. ignorance. And then someone shows you what you do, and it's embarrassing. Oh no, you know, <laughs> yeah. you haven't been doing it. Um, 
I've, I've started writing more <coughs> conscious songs, um, and I wrote a song that's, um, it sounds like it's funny, but it's not, but it's an apology to the cows for what we've done to them. And I tell the story about it before, when I perform it live, I tell the story about how there's cows in the field next to me, and I walk past them every day. And I, I know where those cows are going. And it's a bit like the concentration camp and the Jews. They knew where they were going, and they, everyone says, oh, if I was one of them, I would have spoke up, but no one speaks up. And I walk past these cows all the time, and I don't say anything. Like, these cows, are, you know, and I said this at a show, and my dad was like, you've got to tone that down, Laura, because people aren't going to, you know, want to watch you perform anymore, because it's, you know, because it made, I was like, and next time you eat a beef burger, have a think about it, guys, hope you enjoy this song, blah, blah, blah. Um, so those were, those were my two points for today, but yeah, I'm glad to be a part of this conversation, and um, I think you're all right, that it really does start with awareness, that's the first step, and once, once everybody knows, the, the artists, the, the companies, everything, then we can make the changes. But while everyone's still asleep, we can't do anything. And the other thing is about being a princess. You know, you think, I don't want plastic bottles. And like, oh, you're a princess. Like, no, no. I'm, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm caring about the planet. Yeah, so. I don't know he wants to. Okay. That's why you're passing the mic. The food is yeah. actually one of the biggest impacts yeah. as well, so it's really hugely important. And on that note, <laughs> uh, I saw something the other day, and it's nothing to well, it is to do with food really, and it a small thing, but it kind of showed to me how subtle, you know, you can make a little comment or of in promotion, and people suddenly become aware. But it was the silliest thing, and it was um, Diddy has got his Ciroc vodka brand on whatever. And he has a new vodka out, and it's like, oh no, this is the blue dad or the white dad, whatever it is. But it was, um, it was a uh, gluten free, and it was the weirdest thing was I didn't even know vodka had gluten in it. <laughs> so again, it was the smallest thing of him making this. He's in the gym, and he's running his little promo, and he's exercising. And he's like, yeah, gluten free vodka. And I'm like, <laughs> and a bit of silly, but it suddenly hit me, and I was like, wow, I didn't know that. But um, it kind of a, a lot of artists, I don't know very many artists that don't want to be involved in some form of charity as they're constantly mm. growing and getting bigger and evolving. And um, it is a case of just making them aware. And you know, if, if artists, right now branding an artist, they go one and one in hand. You know, a, a lot of the times, especially with uh, not necessarily selling MP3s anymore and everything coming to streaming, there is um, an artist will have their hands in a lot of different pots to survive. So I think if there is a way to kind of, <coughs> without sounding corny, making it a little bit more trendy or having certain things where there are brands involved where you can throw in and implement and say, oh, by the way, do you know what I mean? These are shoes made of, or I don't know. Do you just kind of see yeah. what I'm saying? And because um, people like that and the kids get excited and go, oh my God, don't you know, I'm a pair of them. Yeah, we have to these, uh, you know, change this stigma of, oh, you have to be kind of a hippie to be environmentally exactly. friendly. We have to make it culturally cool, mm -hmm. trendy, and music is a great way, or through products, brands. Exactly, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because uh, whatever tends to be the, the, the newest thing that's out that people like, that think is cool, um, <laughs> it tends to, and if, if we can make the environment part of that, then, yeah. So just and, I mean, you've got uh, festivals like Brainchild, which is a young festival, but they are pure on eco. Yeah. Um, it's one of the ones that United Vibrations has headlined quite a few times, a lot of our other artists. And, and that is a group of young people, uh, Marina and Luke Newman and all the rest of their team, coming together with an idea. And when they put on the festival, not only is it amazing, but they leave the place just, just yeah. spotless. And yeah. actually throughout, I don't remember being ever being there and thinking, oh, this is such a mess or whatever. It's it's ongoing because actually this is the new generation. Yeah. And there is, you know, we did invite um, uh, Luke and, and Marina, but they were busy. But there is a generation that, that, that actually, if you could hook up with them, I'd love to intro, mm. <laughs> intro Bay the Grandchild uh, to you. I was gonna leave it out there for other <laughs> artists to speak and uh, I don't know, Cal and new people to all of this, so we've got Michelle from CM as well. Um, it's not always, we don't have to be, always be right. You know, my one little, I didn't do it all the time, but my one little litter out of the van and, and Ahmad on my case changed my way of thinking and, and a realization that I would certainly <coughs> say I recycled all my food at home. Um, I recycle everything, actually. 
I probably put out a lot of stuff on, on recycle. And I'm quite lucky, the difference to you, Laura, across the road from me, I've got a recycle site. So um, everything goes over there and gets split up on the, on the larger items. But I think, you know, as artists, you, you have a role in, in spreading the word through lyric and through music, but also just the way that you are. I mean, even at this early stage. Exactly, starting yeah. from the very can beginning. I, I think, I think that's that, that, that was really, I really like what you said. And the, and, the, and the effect it had, the impact it had on you. There's also, do I need the mic? They want it, help Do I now, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So. There's, um, at any level, there's, a, there's an old, uh, uh, something I was just thinking about, is recycling instruments. And just, the, so it doesn't have to be global impact. It's just like, it's, I have to, I'm just, for myself, I've definitely had quite a few instruments. And I was thinking, yeah, but I actually I woke up and started lending them to other artists or to nephews or to someone else so they're not just sitting in a case getting grey or dirty. I'm not, not looking at you. But, yeah. but it's just, it's to share it. Old laptops, how many, we all buy the same. Everyone's got an Apple, mm. Apple lap, laptop, same software. And maybe we don't all need to duplicate it or maybe we can share it. Re recycling, I think that's another thing. Yeah, there's a. Yeah, yeah. yeah. instruments are meant to be played. In yeah. fact, when I was when I was younger, I, I wanted to borrow an instrument. Someone lent me. I didn't have it. I wanted to get a double bass, and someone lent me a double bass. It was so good. I wanted to buy it, and they said you can't buy it. It belonged to a family, and their son had died, and he used to play it. And so they just said we just wanted to play. It. I've always remembered that such a beautiful wow. sentiment. Yeah. We just wanted to play. And I was thinking, oh, later on, when I had my mouth, I want to buy that bass. I said, no, it's, it's, it's to be played. And I was thinking, that stuck with me. And I realised I had instruments that just sitting in cases, the studios that were, or either they're valuable or they've got sentimental value, but instruments are meant to be played. Yeah. And, and seriously, if you play a vintage instrument from the 50s or 60s, which is the kind of holy grail of instruments, if you take one that's been um, kept in plastic, I've done this, you pay one that's been kept in plastic and maybe a stock investor, someone bought it as an investment and never played it, so it's never been unwrapped. And then you play one that's been played all around the world and trodden on and thrown up. The one that's been played always sounds better. Always yeah. sounds better. It's got, thank you, it's got life, yeah. it's wood, it's the one that speaks to you, it's the one that makes your music come alive. The other one, and that's the other thing that stuck with me, so maybe a culture of, uh, you probably do that here because you probably uh, using instruments in the studio and yep. rehearsal rooms. Right? Well, the studio, I mean, the idea anybody who comes here can oh. use all the instruments that are here. Yeah. Uh, that's what they're there for. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day. They don't have to even have their own. And that's what you could do on any level, I think, rather than waiting to go. I mean, can we talk about festival that still like again? It's a bit further up. It's a bit, it's a bit further it's on. A step removed. You've just reminded me of something that came up last week or a couple of weeks ago. We did a conference, um, Green Events and Innovations, and there was a woman from the Soil Association who does FSC certifications, the for Forest Forestry Stewardship Council certification, and uh, she was talking about one place and I don't remember where it was but they produce blackwood and that blackwood is what's used for wind instruments um, it's a very specific type of wood and they've been FSC certified which means that you can then purchase instruments that are FSC right. certified or that aren't so if you're not sharing an instrument but getting a new one that's an important element to look at as well where is your instrument itself even coming from and what impact is that having yeah. mm -hmm. so and where, where are they getting their because the the Brazilian yeah, wood is what those same instruments I was talking about that were the Holy Grail of Nigel were made with uh, Brazilian wood from the Amazon Yeah, forest. and you want to hope that they're being preserved so they can be created. Well, no, you, you, well. you need a certificate to say where it's coming from now. Mm, because so there's different international exactly, wood traders to prevent deforestation. Yeah. Exactly. Um, no, there's a big campaign, a music campaign actually in the US called No More Bloodwood, which is looking specifically at this, which is where is your instrument coming from? Is it causing deforestation somewhere else in the world? What kind of cert certificates do you need to be looking out for when you're when you're buying your new instrument? Um, one of the really big guitar makers actually got into a lot of trouble a few years ago, I won't say, okay. yeah. uh, but um, because they were they were sourcing their wood unsustainably from the big forest and it was causing deforestation, um, and they they got quite a fine for it. Um, 
So I think that's one. And, and I think going back to some of the things that we've heard, I think it's important as an artist, you find, you find your space, like regardless of where you are in your career, you find your space and you start understanding where your spheres of influence are. And if you're earlier on in your career, they might not be as broad, but they're still everyone that you have a conversation with. And you figure out, you know, what is it that I want to stand for? And then within that, opportunities as well. Like, I think it's interesting with the brand partnerships because that kind of thing works better for some kinds of artists. You had Gorillas last year did a big campaign around a solar powered studio and encouraging other artists. It was a, it was a sponsorship campaign with a, an energy company that were trying to launch new solar batteries for home use. But so they did this big campaign around a solar powered studio, going to record, um, encouraging people to go and record, I think, at something, a mobile solar powered studio that they set up as well. You have Pharrell, who's got shares um, in a company called Bionic Yarn, that among other things uses ocean plastic waste um, to turn into new fabric. And then they did a big partnership with Raw. So it was Raw for the Oceans. Pharrell was a big spokesman for that. So you do, you, you're starting to see some of these brand partnerships as well, which are working particularly for you know, more commercial spheres, sort of not just what difference am I trying to make in, within the industry, but also throughout everything that I do, so including the kinds of sponsorship partnerships that I'm willing to, mm -hmm. to, to make, actually. Um, yeah. Well, I think on that, unless anyone has any more questions, um, you know, I think this is a really important discussion. I think, you know, some of the main points that were raised were that we do need to open up this conversation. We need to bring more artists, more people from the music industry <coughs> together with environmentalists to start you know, planning early to make things green for the future. And also, you know, starting young, starting at the very beginning of your career, what you're doing here at MIDI is amazing, and, and talking about these things. And then some of the things we just talked about now is that you can, you can start today by simply sharing an instrument, or, you know, thinking about the choices that you make as an individual, from recycling to, you know, the next gig that you host, make it plastic free. Um, but we can all start today, we can all have an impact, and this is for the future of our planet. And there's someone else that has a question. Yeah, yeah. Hi, yeah. The question is uh, because I'm uh, a chef as well, so I work in kitchens, and um, so we're talking about food, and um, would you be interested in coming like in different type of events and speak like about this? Have this conversation like vegan fest. There is one uh, in Greenwich on the 6th of uh, April. Um, and there's all the things like that happening that I think would be interesting to link both of those uh, areas, food and music, because that's where all the... Yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, like I say, Ross Gilder Festival is one example mm. where they analyzed, that's like the biggest festival in Denmark, one of the biggest in Europe, and they analyzed the impact of all elements of their production and found that the production impact of the food that they were selling was their biggest impact. Mm -hmm. And so to make it seasonal, as much vegan, vegetarian as possible, they decided to not ban meat, but what they did is made a requirement for 90% of the food to be organic, which meant it was really expensive to get meat, which meant that everyone naturally reduced the amount of meat that they were selling and reduced the amount of waste as well. So it's quite an interesting way around, but certainly it's such a hugely important topic. Yeah. And you know, climate change touches all aspects of our lives. You know, we have people here today as well from the gaming space that we're talking to as well. How can we make the gaming industry more sustainable, more green? How can gaming audiences care about the planet? Like today we're having these discussions on how music can make an impact, how gaming, how food. So, you know, this is something that affects all of us in every aspect of our lives. So yeah, it would be amazing to have more discussions with more people and you know, start talking about it because, you know, as you said, if people don't know, people won't make a change. If people don't know what solutions are out there, they also won't make a change.